Good morning. It's me again. For those of you who don't know, because I realize I didn't introduce myself earlier, my name is Toby Palmer. I'm the director of student ministry and local missions here, and I have the privilege of sharing the word with all of you, uh, for which I am incredibly grateful. Today, we are going to be in the final passage of the Sermon on the Mount. We finally made it. Um, Chapter 7, verses 13 through 29, if you want to go ahead and turn there in your Bible. Um, Before we get started... I usually at this point when I'm teaching the youth, I ask a question. Uh, This isn't really the setting to be asking questions, but I do want you to think to yourself, think about a time where you've come to a point where you had to make a choice. Like maybe you had procrastinated, maybe there was something on the horizon, you knew you needed to make a decision about it, but you just were putting it off. But that point had finally come. I think reading and preaching through the Sermon on the Mount is a bit like that. You're reading, you're hearing, you're hearing all that Jesus has to say, and in some ways you can defer judgment. You can defer what you're going to do about it, but today is the day that you're going to have to make a choice. This is the passage where that procrastination ends, and you have to decide, are you going to take what he said seriously Or are you going to go on about your merry way? Before we jump into the passage itself, I want to set the context. Of course, this comes at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, not all the way through Matthew 17. It's just Matthew chapter 7. Um, Chapters 5 and 7, it's it's kind of the gospel of Matthew's way of framing Jesus' message. Because, you know, he's going about the cities and the towns and the region of Galilee and is saying he's proclaiming the kingdom Um, of God, and he's healing the sick, casting out demons, doing all these amazing things. In chapter 5 through 7, you have the largest body body of teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, or in the the Gospel of Matthew. And then chapters 8 through 10 is Jesus' miracles in the Gospel of Matthew. So it's kind of encapsulating what Jesus did while he was in Galilee. So this is really, really, if you want to know what Jesus' message of the kingdom was, it's in the Sermon on the Mount. This is what he was preaching. In this passage today, Jesus is going to call us to respond. He's going to call us to respond to what we've heard in the sermon. And he illustrates that there are really only two ways that we can respond. Like, there's not a third option. You can go one way or you can go another. And he does this through three parables. There's two paths in verses 13 through 14. Two trees in verses 15 through 23. And then two builders in verses 23 or 24 through 27. And in these three parables, Jesus forces us to a point of decision. We've essentially come to a fork in the road. You knew it was coming. You you saw it down there and now we're here and you need to make a choice. Let's jump into the two paths. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and few are those who find it. So we have two paths. He gives us this option. He tells us to enter through the narrow gate, but he's like, just in case you wanted to know, here's path number one. The gate is wide. It's not hard to go through. Anybody can walk through this gate. The path is broad. In other words, you can walk down the right side. You can walk down the left side. If you so choose, you can zigzag your way down it. There's many ways to get down this path. It's open. It's easy. It's accessible. It's not hard. You don't have to do anything. There's no effort involved. In fact, I would go as far to say that if you wanted to just sit down, you might even just slide down it. I don't, I'm not even sure you need to walk. This is an easy path. Many enter through it. It's inclusive. Everybody can show up. There's, no, there's, no, there's nobody at the gate checking your ticket. There's nobody trying to make sure that you are really committed to this path. If you're on it, you're on it. It leads to destruction. 
y'all, there are a million ways to make it to hell. There are countless ways to walk away from God. And you could be as close to the narrow path as you want, but if you're not on the narrow path, this is the path you're on. So let's hear a little bit about that narrow path. Jesus tells us the gate is narrow. It isn't easy to get through. How many of y'all have been around cattle? Do you know how they have the cattle shoots? Like a cow has to force their way, and really, I mean, this is how they make steers, if I'm not mistaken. They put them in the cattle chute because they can't move around. It's too narrow. And it's designed to be that way so you can regulate the flow of cattle. When you want to get a bunch of cattle in one place, it's usually not through a cattle chute. I haven't spent a lot of time around cattle, so if you have, forgive my analogy, but I think it made the point. This gate is narrow. It only allows so much through. You can't, it's not easy to get through. The path is hard, and we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about more what that means here in a second, but just know this. The other path was easy. It's broad. There's no difficulty walking down it. This one is not that way, and there's few who find it. Notice Jesus said there are few who entered through the wide gate. They're not looking for it. It just happens to be there. It's the default option. This is a path that you have to want. This is a gate that you have to want to go through. You have to decide to walk through it. You have to seek it out and find it. You don't enter through this gate by accident. That broad gate, you can go in through that, you can go through that by accident, but this gate, no, you have to find it. And those who find it will be few. But as discouraging as all that sounds, here's the encouraging part: it leads to life. This narrow gate, this difficult path, the way of the few leads to life. Let's talk a little bit about more, a little bit more about what he means when he says it's a hard way. The Greek word for hard here is called, it's flevo, um, and I put it in English letters for you guys so it's easier to read. It's related, well, it, it means something like to press upon, to afflict, to oppress, to really just kind of hammer down, if you will. It's related to the word flipsis. Whenever you see the word tribulation in the Bible or affliction in the Bible, this word flipsis is, under, is undergirding it. And that word flipsis comes from this, from this verb flevo, which means to oppress, to afflict. In other words, this path that Jesus is calling us to walk down, it's not as if I mean, have you guys ever been hiking? There's this great staircase over off of the, I think it's the Brazos River in um, Waco. Have you all ever been there? Okay, there's a staircase there called Jacob's Ladder. And it, it's, it's like a 150-foot staircase or something like that. It's hard to walk up. It's not just talking about that, though. Like, it's not just like you might slip. You might lose your step. You really have to want it, and your thighs are going to burn by the time you get to the top. It's not just that, like... There are troubles coming on this path. Like, people are going to want to kill you for walking this path. People are going to hate you for walking this path. This is a path of affliction. This is a path of suffering. This is the path that the world would say leads to death. This is a difficult, difficult road to walk but it leads to life. It leads to life. If you want resurrection, you can't have it without tasting death. This is a path that feels like death, but y'all, it leads to resurrection life. If if it weren't clear enough, Jesus is now going to talk to us about two trees. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, 
but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And on that day, many will say to me, oh, I already read that, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So Jesus begins this parable by talking about false prophets, and he circles back to those false prophets, I believe, in verse 19. And he tells us a couple things about false prophets. First, these are people in the church. These are people who look like they're a part of the flock. They seem like they belong. They're not easy to spot. They look like other Christians. They're doing the works of God. They're prophesying. They're casting out demons. They're healing people. They're performing miracles. They're doing the sorts of things that you would think the people of God are doing. And here's the kicker. They call Jesus Lord. In other words, they know the right answer. They know the right answer to the question. Who's Lord? Jesus. How do you get to heaven? Jesus. They've probably asked Jesus into their heart if we're going to talk in a southern idiom. These are people who prayed the sinner's prayer. And in fact, I, I'm guessing that they probably think that they're Christians too. And we'll talk about why I think that here in a sec. But here's what Jesus makes really clear. You're going to know them by their fruit. A tree can only produce fruit that is consistent with the kind of tree that it is. I didn't know this until I went to California this year, and I feel kind of stupid, but did you know oranges grow on trees? <laughs> I always wondered where they came from. They come from trees, it turns out. <laughs> and apples, apples, guess what, guys? Apples also grow on trees. And if I walk up to an apple tree expecting an orange, I'm going to be very disappointed. And likewise, if I walk up to an orange tree expecting an apple, I'm going to be very disappointed. A tree can only produce the kind of fruit that is consistent with that tree. If the tree is good, it'll produce good fruit. If the tree is bad, like uh, what is that one fruit from Indonesia? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Durian. Yeah, if it's a durian, it's going to produce bad fruit. <laughs> Sorry if you like durian. I'll pray for you. Um, <laughs> It's going to produce bad fruit. A person can only produce fruit consistent with the kind of person that they are. They can fool people for a while. A bad person can make people think that they are good for a long time. Eventually, the truth will come out. And just as a quick aside, if you want to know what kind of fruit a Christian should be producing... Go read Galatians chapter 6 and read the whole passage because it also talks about the fruit of evil. It also talks about, uh, the, the, what is it, the fruit of sin full of the flesh, fruit of the flesh, fruit of the spirit. Contrast those two. And Paul makes it real clear, real quick, what a believer looks like versus what an unbeliever looks like in the church. One produces division and strife and jealousies and quarreling. The other produces characteristics that bring life to the body. That's not what this sermon is about. Go read that if you're interested. False prophets will be found out in the end. Like, the kind of fruit that they produced with their life's work in the church is going to be discovered. And Jesus promises us that those people are going to be cut up by the root and thrown into the fire. You have two choices here. Are you going to be like these false prophets? Say all, and do, in your mind, all the right things. Or are you going to submit to the lordship of Jesus? 
Are you just going to call him Lord or are you going to live like it? Then Jesus talks about on that day. And I think here he's talking about those false prophets because here's the thing, y'all. If you claim to be a Christian, you also claim to speak for God. Like you are the place where the Holy Spirit dwells and God is working in and through you in the world. So if you claim to be a Christian, this warning is every bit as pertinent to you as it is to someone who stands on stage and teaches every Sunday morning. You are the mouthpiece of God to someone in the world by virtue of calling on the name of Jesus. To someone you are a prophet. So beware that you're not false. Because many will say to him, Lord, Lord, and he's going to look at those people and he's going to say, I didn't know you. They're going to even list their works. They're going to look, 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 God, I prophesied in your name. I spoke to people about you. I shared the gospel with people. They're going to say, Lord, Lord, I cast out demons in your name. I healed the sick. I did many works of powers. I did miracles. I did it all in your name. They're going to come to God and they're going to say, look, at, look, God, look at all these things I've done for you. And he's going to say, that's not what it was about. That was never what it was about. Those things are good. Those things are cool. I don't want them. They're going to list these impressive works, and they're going to present them to God as a way of saying, look, I should be a part of your family. And he's going to say, where in the world did I command you to do any of that? You want to know what Jesus commands? Read the Sermon on the Mount. Where in it does he say, go prophesy? Where in it does he say, Go heal the sick. Where in it does he say any of these things? You know what he says? He says, love your enemy. He says, stop hating people. He says, forgive. He says, when you pray to me, do it in secret. He says, if you're going to fast, don't let people know about it. He says, hey, I know you care about that money, and I know that's how you live in the world. Give all of that over to me. Seek the kingdom first. If you want to know what Jesus commands, it's in the sermon. Don't deceive yourself to think that you can do all of these things to please God and that somehow that makes you right with him. And oftentimes the things that we think we're doing to please God are not even the things he commanded. God, I served at Awanas. God, I volunteered in the youth group. God, I went to seminary, and I'm teaching on a Sunday morning. God didn't command any of that. What he commanded is that you would follow after him. And he explained exactly how to do that in the Sermon on the Mount. Don't deceive yourself. And don't think because you prayed a sinner's prayer that that is what saves you. What saves you is surrendering to who Jesus is and what he's done and following after him. That's who inherits the kingdom of heaven. And just as if it wasn't clear enough, Jesus, Jesus gives us one more, one more parable to consider. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sands. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. What is Jesus talking about when he says these words of mine? Salvation? Yeah. Foundation? Yeah, this is going to be your foundation. He's talking, I think, what are the words that he's just spoken? Sermon on the Mount. I don't think he's mincing words here. I don't think this is, is, this is some esoteric saying. I think he's saying, hey, these words, these things that you have just heard me say, I think that's what he's talking about. It likely refers to the Sermon on the Mount. I do think that we can legitimately extend that to the rest of Jesus' teachings 
in the Gospel of Matthew, and probably his teachings in the rest of the Gospel, and through the Apostles, so on and so forth. Because I do believe that those things are consistent with Jesus' teaching, and in some ways flesh it out a bit more than Jesus himself did, because, hey guys, he only ministered for three years. He only had so much he could say during that time. Um, and he left the rest to his apostles who were working through the Holy Spirit. But ultimately, I think he's talking about his teachings, and most especially, I think he's talking about his teachings in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, because he had just finished giving them. And when people are hearing this, that's what they're going to be thinking of. Then he tells us about a wise builder and a foolish builder. A wise builder is one who hears these words and does them. The foolish builder is one who hears these words and does not do them. You see what what I was saying when there's really only two options here? You can either hear what Jesus has said and do it, or you can hear what he has said and ignore it. There's not a third option. It's one or the other. And what is the house? That wasn't supposed to be there. I think the house refers to kind of our life's work. Like, hey, here's the, here's the reality of this situation. For those of us who have been following Jesus for some time, I would like a show of hands of, of the people who have not messed up. <laughs> okay, that's what I expected. And for you, those of you who are interested in following Jesus... I hope that lack of a show of hands demonstrated to you that it's not really about being perfect. But I do think that the trajectory of our life matters. I do think that the genuine Christian is going to be growing in holiness because they're indwelled by the Holy Spirit who is motivating them to live a godly life. And I think when judgment day comes, God's going to look at the trajectory of our lives, and I think it's going to matter. Here's another reason why I think that. There's a storm coming, and I think a lot of times when people have read this passage, we try to overly spiritualize it, and we try to make it about the storms of this life. There's a really great song by Amy Grant, right? (laughs) On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. (laughs) You know what I mean? That's my bad Amy Grant impression. But (laughs) I think we try to make it about storms of this life. Like when bad things happen in this life, we're either going to stand or we're going to fall, and we're going to stand if we're based on the teachings of Jesus, and we're going to fall if we're not. I think that is a severe watering down of what Jesus is really saying here. I think what he's saying here is actually a lot more convicting. I think what he's saying here is a lot more serious than that. Not that that isn't true, by the way. It is true. That's what's going to get you through the hard things of life. But let's take a look at the context here. The two paths parables clearly, clearly refers to judgment. Like, I don't know what else the distinction between destruction and life could refer to if it's not heaven or hell. The parable of the trees also references one's ultimate destiny because what happens to the tree that's not producing good fruit? It's uprooted and thrown into the fire. What else could that be referencing? And when Jesus is talking to those false prophets who are saying, Lord, Lord, look at all these cool things we did for you, and he's saying, away from me, I never knew you. He starts that saying with, on that day. What day do you think he's talking about? I don't know what day he's talking about if he's not talking about Judgment Day, but the clear reading of the text is that's exactly what he's talking about. So why would he switch here? Why would he be talking about judgment and then suddenly turn and start talking about, I don't know, the storms of this life? You know what I'm saying? It just doesn't make a lot of sense. The clearest reading of this text is that Jesus is talking about final judgment. And he is clearly saying, you are going to be judged based on what you did with what I said. Like, Your obedience is the measure by which you are going to be judged. I don't think he's mincing words. And I think we try to get around that fact because it's really easy to live a spiritual life where we think, God does not care what I do. 
I prayed a prayer when I was seven. I was baptized at seven. And I think it would be really easy for me to live my life as if God did not care what I did. Because I said that prayer and I was baptized at that age. Jesus is not interested in you saying a prayer and getting baptized. He wants you to get baptized and he wants you to say a prayer. What he's interested is are you going to give your whole heart to him? Are you going to surrender all that you are, lay all of yourself down and say, God, I can bring nothing to this. I have nothing to give. And the way that I have been living life is not working. And I need resurrection. I need new life. I need what you have, and I'm going to give everything up for that. That is what saving faith is. And when you do that, Jesus himself says it, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Obedience really isn't optional. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. Is there grace? 100%. We're saved only by grace. Is the Holy Spirit empowering us to live this way? Yes, so we're not really doing it on our own, but saving faith does lead to obedience. And I don't think you can get, I don't think you can read this text and get around that fact. I really don't. We get to the crowds. And I think this is something that we often skip over when we're teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, but I want you to pay attention to their reaction. Jesus finished teaching He's, when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowd were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as their scribes. There's two crowds for this sermon. There's the original disciples and those who were surrounding them as Jesus was teaching. Because this passage makes it clear that Jesus allowed the crowds to overhear what Jesus was teaching his disciples. And there's the crowd of people in this room right now. There's a crowd of everybody else who has ever heard the words of this sermon. And I think it's not by accident that the Bible makes us privy to their response. Because it asks us to question what our response is going to be. Here's their response. They responded in amazement. Astonishment. In fact, you could read that As if they're like, how dare you? (laughs) Like, our teachers don't even teach this way, and you think you can make these kinds of claims on us? Or, wow, what a great sermon. I'm going to go journal about that. (laughs) Maybe I'll pick a quote here or there. The thing is, is they're amazed, they're astonished, and they don't really do anything with it. Y'all want to hear something really interesting? Gandhi carried a, it's said, I, don't, I, I haven't asked him, he's dead. But he once said that he carried, the sermon on, he carried the Sermon on the Mount with him. Gandhi, wherever he went. Gandhi was a Hindu. He was amazed with the moral teachings of Jesus. He was astonished at the kinds of things that Jesus taught. Who cares? That didn't save him. Are you going to listen to the Sermon on the Mount and be amazed? Live in awe of what Jesus has taught? Maybe even be inspired by his moral teachings? Or are you going to respond in obedience and surrender? There's really only two options. You either... Obey or you don't. You either give everything up and try to live this kind of life or you don't. Being amazed at Jesus is not good enough. Being astonished by his teachings, maybe even inspired, possibly indignant, is not enough. That's that broad path. That's that wide gate. The narrow gate is the gate of surrender and obedience. So what? Jesus has spoken. Jesus has spoken, and you have to respond. Like, because he has said something, you have to do something with what he said. And setting it aside and putting it off until later 
is a choice in and of itself. You have to respond. Also, our response to Jesus' teaching is absolutely a salvation issue. This isn't a negotiable. You don't get to hear what Jesus has said, say, I don't want that, and then get to go on your merry way, because guess what? Your response to the teaching of Jesus is your response to Jesus. Like, what you do with what he said is exactly what you do with him. You can't divorce the two. You can't take Jesus and reject his teachings. Also, in this passage, and I think really in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has helped us count the cost here. The way to life is the way of suffering and affliction. Obedience to the one who was crucified leads us to live a life, the same kind of life as the one who was crucified. A master is not greater than his servants. If they hated me, they will hate you also. The way to life is through death. Death to self, death to this world, and all that it has to offer. The way to healing is the way of suffering and heartache and pain. It's difficult, at times unbearable. But it leads to life because it leads to Jesus. And so I just want to challenge you today, if you are a believer and you are not living in obedience, let this be a gut check. God is not going to cast you from his sight. Neither height nor depth can separate us from the love of God. But your obedience does matter. Like, God has a life that he wants you to live. And it's honestly the best life you could live. And if you are here this morning and you are not living that kind of life, I want to challenge you, recommit, respond to what Jesus has said, and surrender to him once again as your Lord. If you are not a believer and you have been here throughout our series on the Sermon on the Mount, first of all, thank you. (laughs) Second of all, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to be like the crowds and just respond in astonishment and amazement and possibly indignation? Or are you going to submit to him as your Lord and follow after him? Those are your two options. And I would encourage you, I would plead with you, I would beg with you to choose to follow him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this challenging text. Thank you, thank you for the gut check, honestly. I think we all have found ourselves in places as believers where we are not following you as we know we should. So Lord, thanks for challenging us. Thanks for calling us to yourself again and again and again through your word. And Lord, though the way is hard, Though the way is marked by affliction and affliction and suffering. May we be faithful to walk it. And may we trust you as you lead us down it. Lord, we love you. We thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Do I read the benediction? Bring it up. <laughs> Where's the benediction? Oh, come pray with us. Oh, here's the benediction. (laughs) Father, to live this week to the full, being true to you in any way. Jesus, help us to give ourselves away to others, being kind to everyone we meet. Holy Spirit, help us to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all we do and say, amen. You are dismissed.